The question of how power operates and how it's changing is something which people haven't explicitly thought about very much until recently. You know, politics, power structures, institutions have just kind of been taken for granted um, for much of the last few decades of the 20th century. But we really are living through a period of incredible flux right now. Um, you know, often if you talk about politics and recent elections, people say, gosh, you know, isn't it surprising that X, Y, and Z happened, that we have D Donald Trump surprising the pollsters, that we have the Italians producing a result no one was expecting, that we had the French, that Jeremy Corbyn almost won the election in the UK. To my mind, what's actually much more surprising is an incredible statistic which Ray Dalio at Bridgewater, who was here early this week, calculated last year, which is that if you calculate the proportion of the vote in the Western world that's gone to populist candidates in recent years, it's jumped from about 5% in 2010 to 35% in 2017. And there's only been one other time in history that you've seen that kind of swing occur before in the 1930s. If you don't believe me, go on LinkedIn and have a look at the post because it's there, extraordinary statistic. But what's perhaps equally remarkable is that we're not just seeing the political arena deliver huge surprises, we're also seeing the corporate world and NGO world deliver big surprises too. I mean, just think about the power of the hashtag MeToo movement in recent um, months and how that's come out of seemingly nowhere and felled all number of big corporate and media icons. Just think of all the ways you're seeing kids and people who wouldn't necessarily be defined as political suddenly jumping into the political arena and acting. There's a really big shift in terms of how power is being exercised and it makes it very unpredictable for people who are used to the old system, which I would guess that most of us in the room looking at the demographic are probably in that camp. So we have a fantastic couple of people to talk about this, what it means, why it's happened, and more importantly, how we can all respond, whether you're in politics, NGOs, or whether you're in the corporate world. Um, we're going to be talking about this book, which is New Power, How Power Works in Our Hyper-Connected World and How to Make It Work for You, in nice, bright, optimistic yellow, so you can all <laughs> see it very clearly. Um, it is on sale afterwards, and it's written by Jeremy Hymans and um, Henry Timms who have a very interesting background. Now, Jeremy Hyman's on my immediate left, your right. Um, I was looking at his bio this morning. He grew up in Australia and apparently decided to become politically active at the age of eight, which makes um, precocious childhoods even more scary. Um, but you spent really most of your career involved in various forms of political activism. Um, these days, you're running a political group, which you can tell us about later, called Power, which is basically um, 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 providing the forum for people around the world to get involved in politics and actually take action. So you can tell us about that. You live in New York, but travel widely. Um, and next to him is Henry Timms, who runs a 92nd Street Y, um, has had a long experience. <laughs> <laughs> home crowd. <laughs> I think you're kind of speaking to your home audience here, so <laughs> you're on your home turf. Um, but before that, you were involved in a number of philanthropic um, movements um, really around the world. Again, you also live in New York. But by an odd coincidence, we both share the same home, hometown, which is Exeter in Devon. Anyone else from Exeter in Devon? Famous mostly for cider and clotted cream. OK, well, we won't give you an advertising brochure for Exeter yet and Devon, but it is beautiful. So right, we're going to start off with one of you two, or both of you like together, just giving us a sort of three, four minute pricey of what exactly is the big idea in your book. Who wants to go first? Are we going to have nice Devon charm or Australian <laughs> hustle? Which one we'll might go we'll first? My colonial this. oppressor here. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're very mean stuff. I, I, I think that means Jeremy Well, this Jer is the new power. Jeremy, gets to, go, Jeremy gets to go first. Oh, all right. Well, look, it's, it's fantastic to be here um, with, with all of you. Um, you mentioned the Me Too movement. That might be a nice jumping off point. You know, what Henry and I wanted to do with this book was really give people a lens and a language to describe what Gillian was, was, was laying out, which is this sense of so much change, um, often coming from these movements, these forms of participation, but people not really understanding what they mean, how to exercise that kind of power. 
So we make this distinction between old power and new power, and I think the easiest way to do that might be to describe the difference between Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement. So you think about how Harvey Weinstein exercised power. And you know, for, for decades, he amassed that power. He very much viewed his power as a currency, something you could hoard up. He used that to punish his uh, enemies, to reward his protectors and his friends. He created this whole industry where he was at the top. At the beginning of the book, we note that uh, the Academy Award acceptance speeches uh, tied for first place in the person most thanked in Academy Award acceptance speeches with Harvey Weinstein was God. Um, and Is that true? Yeah. God and Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Gives God a bad name. <laughs> that is, that's amazing. And, and Henry, maybe I'll let you uh, characterise the Me Too movement. Well, and you think how different that kind of power is to the power of the, the Me Too movement, which of course began with the activist Tarana Burke um, almost a decade ago, but, but really caught fire around the world. And, and it wasn't power as a currency. I've got it, you haven't, I can hoard it up. It was power that worked much more like a current. It flowed and it surged around the world. And as every woman stepped forward and told her story, she made the overall movement more stronger. It, it was not leader-driven, uh, but leader-full. It was open, not closed. It was a very different way of expressing power. And as, as Me Too moved around the world and toppled giants as it did, it also morphed as a movement. So when Me Too got to France, it became denounce your pig. It was a very French feel to the movement. And it sort of moved around the world. Well, denounce so, your pig. You're going to have to unpack that for this audience because most people in this audience haven't got pigs. Pigs? Pigs. 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 Yeah. Like, pigs. Like, men are pigs. So denounce right. your pig was you would <laughs> denounce the pig in your life and you would, right. have, you would draw out that person and say, person X is a pig. And so that was how... More visceral than the American version. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, Cushon. Yeah, and also, exactly. I know animals are, are a theme here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, so it's very good to make sure we cover that base early on. We were so, talking earlier about the fact that politics has been eclipsed by dogs at this, this year's Aspen Ideas Festival. So. <laughs> so you think about those two forms of power, right? We think old power of Harvey, you know, he holds it up, he, can, he controls an industry, he can hoard his power like a currency. The Me Too movement is surging and flowing like a current, and you can see those dynamics playing out across all aspects of our lives. As, as Gillian noticed, we see that in politics. You see the old power of political parties um, just in, in recent days, um, congressmen who have been in place for, for the term after term after term being swept away by these new power movements. You see it in, in the corporate world. You see hotel chains who for years have had all the power and hoarded up at the top being dispersed by Airbnb. You see uh, taxi firms and Uber. As you begin to search around the world and you see this frame of new power and old power, it gives people a lens for how to understand the world. So the reason we wrote the book was we wanted to kind of give people this frame for the world, uh, help right. people understand how to navigate that world, and then most importantly, start a bigger conversation about what kind of world we really will want to live in. Right. Well, I must say, I think the point that you make about speed mm. is very striking, because as it happens, the last time I personally saw Harvey Weinstein was actually about 20 yards away from here, um, about um, last September, in fact. Right. It was a weekend of Charlie Rose's... Um, he gathers together, you know, all the groups oh, together. <laughs> it's, it what? was actually called Weekend with Charlie Rose, um, with, you know, 100 people or so gathered around, all these luminaries and CEOs and stuff. And I actually had a very long chat with Harvey Weinstein, a very long drink in the bar with him, actually. And he was acting like somebody, this was literally two weeks before the whole thing exploded, he was acting like somebody who was obviously under pressure, and I couldn't work out why, but was absolutely all-powerful. Right. Mm. And you fast forward just a few weeks. And I mean, if you then look at the snowball of people who were drawn into the hashtag MeToo movement, I mean, it would make anyone say, how on earth do we predict what's going to happen in this kind of, you know, extraordinary world these days? I think, and the snowball matters. So I think, you know, this is one of the things that is new about the current context. So of course, you've had many social movements um, in the past, including the feminist movement, but the ability for this to kind of to spread so quickly, to topple giants the way it does, in some ways is, is contributing to these very rapidly shifting social norms. Um, and it would have been you know, easier, I think, for incumbent power, for old power, to have kind of reorganized itself in response to a movement like Me Too if it were not moving at this absolute hyperspeed, which, which is creating a whole bunch of new dynamics. So what is driving this? Is this above all else our cell phones? Is it just cell phones, internet connections? Um, or is there something else going on as well? So I think there are, there are two interconnected things. One, of course, technology is changing. But that's also changing all of us. So you think back to 
um, when I grew up in Exeter, in Devon, I, I had ideas. This is a festival of ideas. I had lots of ideas about the world I wanted to share with the world. And I essentially had two routes to spread my ideas with the world. Route one was get my articles published in the local Express and Echo newspaper, um, which never happened. Article after article were rejected. Route two was I would sit on my stairs on sure, the second... Gillian probably got a few. Gillian, got, a few in. Gillian no, got all no, of no, hers no. in. So or route two was I would sit on the second floor of my house and I would phone up the radio station, Radio Devon, time and time again and try and get on the talk show. Those were my routes of participation. Those are the ways I could engage with the world. Flash forward to today, to, to kids growing up today, or to all of us today. Um, look at the Never Again kids who started that extraordinary conversation around the country around gun control. They are connected with a scale, a speed, and a kind of cross-sectoral approach that is transforming these moments so quickly. But there's something else changing too. They enter the world expecting to participate. Right? Their expectation isn't that I'm going to sit here and wait for institutions to tell me what to do. I'm going to wait for smart people to have ideas that I can consume. I'm going to wait for companies to give me products that I'm going to buy. You have a generation of people who come into the world expecting to shape it in their own image. And, and people who are winning, whether that's companies or politicians, are recognizing we have to create ways to structure for participation. But your question I have is, do kids come in today and expect to take part in politics? Because... You know, I'm part of the generation that was shocked by the Brexit result in the UK. And a very big reason why Brexit won the vote was because kids, teenagers, or not teenagers, but people in their 20s, for the most part, simply didn't bother to get out and vote. And there's this huge paradox in that certainly in the UK, people are very happy to vote indefinitely or over and over again for, you know, you know all these talent shows and things like that. They're very happy to tweet away. They're very happy to tell their friends what they think about stuff, you know, likes, not likes, all that kind of stuff. But kids were not voting, or what I call kids, people in their 20s, were not voting um, in the elections. Oh, I think this is the central paradox, and it, and it illuminates why this is such a challenge, which is that there's no doubt young people are highly participatory, including in politics. You go on social media and they are constantly engaging, sharing content, expressing their views on politics. But they are more and more sceptical of the formal institutions through which political participation is channeled. So when we you know, all think, well, obviously the only way to participate in politics is by, by voting or by, by going through those institutions, and then we're shocked, you know, as, as I was in the 2016 election, you know, we were working on trying to get millennial age people excited about the election. And they weren't that excited, even though the, the Trump um, threat was so big. Because Hillary Clinton was seen as a very in, you know, incumbent, very institutional candidate, um, they couldn't really be motivated um, in the same way that they were motivated by major social movements like Black Lives Matter. And so that's a big challenge. And what it actually requires our institutions to do, what it requires old power to do really, is to, to start to adapt those institutions to the new ways people want to participate. Because if the ways you participate are so deeply disengaging or alienating to young people, then if we want to preserve the institutions, we have to actually reimagine them. But do you think part of the problem is about the idea of having institutions and party platforms in the first place? I mean, as an anthropologist, I've been fascinated by what I think is a generational shift going on, which is a move not so much about a me generation, which was really what dominated in the late 20th century, me at the centre of the world, but what I call Generation C, generation customization, in that we have kids growing up with these things who assume almost take it for granted they can customise everything right. in a way that most of us had no idea could ever happen. I mean, think about music. You know, when we were kids, you, know, you had a record album with preset choices of music, and now everyone chooses their playlist. Um, you know, Starbucks, you go to Starbucks and teenagers customise their drinks you know, until the cows come home. Every, you know, this constant customization, pick and mix of everything. And when I look at kids in politics, they're kind of pick and mixing issues and brands and ideas and people, but not parties anymore. Is that a bad thing? Well, I don't know. I mean, you can't have much of a sort of serious conversation about trade-offs if you're basically single issue all the time, can you? Are they really single issue though? I mean, I think, I think you're absolutely right. That's a central theme of our book is this, is this extensibility, this fact that people can adapt things. But you think about the Me Too movement, that's what gives it its strength or Black Lives Matter. It's the fact that people can take the idea, can make it their own, can adapt it. It's also, unfortunately, what makes things like ISIS and terrorist networks spread so effectively. Because you can take an ideology like ISIS, which is essentially a medieval theocracy, but as we describe in the book, you can be a teenage girl in Scotland 
Mm. And you can take that ideology and you can customise it to get other teenage girls from the West over to join you in Syria. And that is the dynamic of our age. So uh, I think we need to figure out how to harness that power because it's... So it's, it's all pick, is it kind of pick and mix customization. Do you think that parties are dead, political parties? Do you think it's time to say, actually, let's leave aside parties as a, as a wonderful 20th century idea like albums, music albums, and have everyone have their own political playlist? I think, I think parties will... I think there'll be a middle ground. I think one of the dangers with this kind of work in general is... Um, we have this kind of, the playlist is a good metaphor. We have, these, we have this kind of album mentality that the job of institutions is to create albums in whatever form, hand those albums down to people who then happily consume the albums, right? That's true of political parties, it's true of industries. But actually, if you use music as a, as a parallel, um, just because that is happening with Spotify doesn't mean music is dead, right? Music, in fact, has never been more alive. There have never been more people listening to music. There have never been more people creating music. There have never been more people sharing music. It's actually a terrific time for music in general now, it's not a very good time for me, people making LPs, right? They are not doing it, or actually, in a weird way, they are doing quite well now. I think vinyl's of, coming back this, a this now, is kind yeah. of fringe backlash <laughs> thing. But, but I think that's the, the, the way to think about this is not we have to choose between complete control and complete chaos, which is often how this is cast, right? There is a middle ground, and where we need to explore is this middle ground. So the party of the future, I think, actually looks a lot more participatory, but shares some common values and some common memes. One of the great critiques of our age is that um, people don't, trust institutions, right? We hear that time and time again, people don't trust institutions. One of the reasons for that is institutions just don't trust people. If you think about your experience, a young person's experience of democracy, um, it's, it's very hard to register to vote often. It's very boring often to go and do that and to engage. Your experience with local government is frustrating. You don't know who your local representatives are or what they do all day. All you hear is stories of corruption <laughs> and people who are part of systems that are not going to help you in any case. Is it any surprise that people don't get terribly excited about parties? I think that if anyone is, is in, and this is an influential crowd, those people who are involved in party politics, there is an urgent need for parties to become more participatory and to recognise that our job isn't to hold people back and say, stop wanting all this change, stop wanting all this agency. Our job is to say, we've never had more human capital than we do right now in the world. There have never been more people wanting to do things. So the question for us who are largely on the side of the angels is, are we going to engage with that human capital or are we going to wish it was 1984 all over again? And I, and I think that's, a, that's an important decision. I mean, one of the things, talking about parties, one of the most interesting episodes politically, I find, think, in the Western world has been Macron. Mm. Because in Macron, pick and mix politics, you know, didn't just go around a brand, i.e. a person, but Macron basically created his own party to fill that pick and mix need because the old parties were seen as being too boring. It was such an Macron is such an interesting blend of old and new power. Yeah. So, as you say, what he takes advantage of is the fact that people were deeply disillusioned by, you know, by the Socialist Party and by the, the Republican Party in the, in, the, in the French context. So they, they sort of abandoned the big parties. He creates this new movement, um, which is real for a while. But what's fascinating is, uh, you know, he actually doesn't really have new power instincts. So he becomes president, and you know, he's not actually governing with that en marche movement. Um, in fact, he's deeply conventional, um, and he's a deeply conventional centrist politician who's not a natural movement leader. So, but as you say, he exploited these new power dynamics um, in order to in order to be elected. So I think the great challenge that poses it's similar to this challenge with with what happened with President Obama. Mm. So Obama you know, clearly elected on a wave of new power, masterfully executes. But once he becomes president, you know, the movement he builds didn't really move with him um, into the White House, nor did it move without him to elect his successor. And that, I think, is, is, is a little bit the tragedy of the Obama presidency, um, is, is that he governed in many ways like a very traditional president, which we now all <laughs> are feeling very nostalgic about. Um, <laughs> but... He missed the opportunity to mobilise, to harness new power, to actually keep that intensity up um, and prevent someone like Donald Trump emerging in his way. Right. Well, one way to look at Macron, Macron was, if you like, the ultimate bait and switch, politically. It really was. Um, but, you know, right now, the reality is that, you know, just about every centrist political movement in Europe is wondering how they can clone Macron and, you know, create an English Macron, a German Macron, an Italian Macron, probably even an American Macron, you know. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's like a, it's a fluke dynamic in a lot of ways. Right. Can we go back for a moment to the issue of trust, though, because you touched on that about institutions, because another thing I find absolutely fascinating, which you talk about in your book, is that everyone says we live in an age when trust is collapsing. 
And if you look at trust in institutions, that is true. I mean, the Edelman survey, Pew survey, all, all the surveys show trust in institutions collapsing. And yet what people don't focus on is that trust in your peer group online in many ways is going up. Yeah. Because the only way that Uber works, and I took an Uber up from Denver to Aspen for an extraordinarily low amount of money, 200 bucks, um, the only way that Uber works, the only way that Airbnb works, the only way that most of the things that we're increasingly relying on work, work is actually through these trust networks online. Um, I don't know if Rachel Botsman is here, but she's wrote a fascinating book the, um, last year called Who Do You Trust? Pointing out this rise of what she calls distributed trust. Yep. So how do you square that? And is that durable? You know, is there a moment going to come when actually distributed trust collapses too? Well, I think it's really, it's a big obligation that the, the, the people like me is the thing that is actually surging in terms of trust. So we don't trust institutions, what we trust is people like me. So all of you in this room, and this is a very influential room, you're all, you're all much more influential now than you already were. Because right now, people's networks are actually gravitating to them, the people they touch in their lives, as instead of the institutions they're engaged with. So to make that example very real, what does that mean if you're, um, let's say, a climate scientist? You're a climate scientist, you've lived in the old power world for years, you've written your papers and you've got your white papers and you've gone to your symposiums and you've had your peer reviews and you've created your product and put it out in the marketplace and you know right now no one's paying much attention to it, right, largely, in, in, in the ways they should be. What is your responsibility to make your ideas spread sideways? And we talk a lot about this idea in the book, which is you, ideas used to spread down, right? Institutions would drop ideas on people's heads. The ideas that we're now spread sideways, they spread from my network to the network over here, to the network over there, to the network over there. So one of the big questions for those running those enlightenment institutions is how do we create ideas that do spread through these networks? And how do you distribute trust in that way? It, it seems to me exactly the kind of issue, not just the academy should be focusing on, but the Aspen Institute itself should be focusing on. You think about, you know, we're here in the Aspen Institute, we have all these ideas that are contained here at Aspen. How do you distribute those to the world, right? Is the question, certainly the question we're asking at the 92nd Street, why, right? We had all these ideas for years, all these amazing people would speak on our stage, they still do, they come to the building. Our question now is how do we distribute those ideas sideways so they can reach more people? Uh, and that seems to me the right way to think about that right. question. Right. And I'm just curious, I'm gonna to go to the audience um, for questions in just a moment. Um, but before I do, I mean, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned some of the good sides. You also mentioned some of the dangers. I mean, politically, one of the problems is that this kind of world of ideas spreading sideways means that if you have a very fractured system, you end up with a lot of essentially intellectual ghettos, echo chambers that don't overlap. They're each convinced they're right. Um, they're all getting their ideas and their sort of sense of what's true from each other. Um, you end up with a world that looks an awful lot like American politics today. Or you have a situation where you get some very virulent, dangerous ideas spreading rap very rapidly, like ISIS, um, in a very negative way. And you can't have easy ways to control that. You can't have easy policy discussions about trade-offs and stuff. So I'm curious, net-net, do you think this new world, this world of new power, is better or worse than what we had, say, 30 years ago? I mean, I think the, the, the jury's out. I think it's up to us to shape that world. And I, I think we'll only get, because you're right, the, the extremism you describe is absolutely being fueled by these new power dynamics. That can't be denied. It's also true that some of these incredibly wonderful movements for love, for compassion, the Parkland kids, the Me Too movement, they're also being fueled by new power. So the question, I think, is really, you know, as we think about the future of institutions, can we... Can we build institutions that harness this energy but structure it smartly? And I think that's the, that's the organizing question of our time. If we don't do that, um, then I do think that ultimately we'll sit here in 30 years and we'll say things just got out of control. Because that is the other question, which is that is this shift permanent? I mean, Neil Ferguson wrote a book about the tower and the square, I think the watchtower and the square, which also captured the difference between these vertical relationships of power, authority and institutions, and these horizontal networks. And the point he made is actually history goes back and forth in swings. That, you know, sometimes you have the network take over, sometimes you have the institution reassert itself. Can you see any way that this shift is going to change or swing back again in the future? Well, I'll give you a perspective on how those two things actually might end up coming together rather than from one to the other. So if you think about, if you think about in a way that one of the most interesting and, and stories about power in the world right now is, is what's happening in China, 
So China, uh, of course, obviously the, the party is, but it's more, it's old power is stronger than ever, right? The, 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 the party itself is becoming more powerful over the state in all sorts of interesting ways and all sorts of worrying ways. But it's a highly participatory society, China, right? This, this is not North Korea, right? The people are very engaged in sharing and shaping and sharing their ideas and having thoughts about shopping and engaging in entrepreneurialism and online gaming. Like, there's a hugely participatory environment, China other than they ring, fin ring fence politics. So you can participate in all these many different and interesting ways, you just can't do the political domain. So you end up in this world, and this is happening recently in China, where actually a lot of the uh, party leaders are now sitting on the governing teams of the platforms, the equivalents of the Facebooks and the Googles in China. So you see the hierarchy and the network actually merging as one, and you start to see the emergence of what we talk of as the platform state. And the platform state is when you see an alliance between both the platform and the state, which feeds the agency of a population who is going to want to engage via their phones, but forces that agency in a more authoritarian direction. And if you want a sobering analysis on this seems very distant, seems very foreign, talking about this in China, just imagine for the sake of, the, of, of argument, and I don't think obviously this would happen, but imagine if Donald Trump had the same relationship with Facebook that he does with Fox News. <laughs> just imagine that for a second in terms of that media company and how it would behave. The power of platforms and states coming together might look like something slightly new. And this gets us back to what we do about all this. Um, there's a reason platforms and strong men are doing so well in this age. Right? There's a reason that's happening. They're, they're offering people kind of the great, this has always been a human need, but it's hypercharged now. People want to feel this sense of belonging and they want to feel the sense of agency. And, and, and those people who are in charge of institutions, the questions we have to ask ourselves every morning is, are we creating new and exciting ways to give people agency and belonging? And we're not going to do that if we keep in this kind of um, LP mindset where we make the order of the tracks and we drop it down on people's heads. Mm. I must say I find the Chinese example fascinating because I was chatting to some Chinese officials a couple of years ago and we were having a big debate about democracy and whether it worked or not in the West. And at one stage, they turned around and said, well, you have democracy and we have social media. And what they meant by that was that they were using social media almost like a weather vane or a temperature right. gauge to read the mood of the Chinese public yeah. and to make sure that they always stayed half an inch ahead of where the explosion was going to be. And they always tried to create you know, safety valves if there was too much heat and light and drama emerging. So they were literally using social media to test the will and the feelings of the people, if you like, not just to control it, but also in some ways to respond to it too. And they sort of said to me, well, isn't that in some ways more democratic? Well, I would say probably not, but yeah. <laughs> it's a different way to think about how do leaders actually engage with the sentiment and feelings of a large number of people. You have to ask yourself a question. What would those young students, those young middle class students who uh, protested at Tiananmen Square in the late 80s be doing today? Um, they didn't have any release valves at that time. There was no social media. They weren't able to engage in this explosion of participation in other realms that Henry describes. My fear is that today those people have been co-opted by all of that other kind of participation um, and, by, and by the kind of the capitalism of, of modern China and that they probably wouldn't be out there protesting in the same way in, in, under the same circumstances. So it's actually very effective. I don't think the, 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 you know, it swings back to, to sort of linear traditional authoritarianism. I think it, it goes to this model of the, of the platform strongman. Um, and in a sense, that's a little bit what we're beginning to see with Trump as well. You know, his, his, his supporters are so empowered. Mm -hmm. They are so unleashed. Um, and um, I don't think Donald Trump revels in uh, complete control of the society. He wants chaos. He wants multiple truths. And that's how he, uh, that's actually how he, he governs. Right. Well, I'm going to turn to the audience now for questions. But before we do, we're going to do a bit of participatory democracy ourselves. Because I'm just curious to get a sense of what the room thinks about this shift in the nature of power. I'm going to ask you, if you can bear it, um, to raise your hands. I'm going to ask you, do you think that this shift in power structures is good or bad or don't know? Three choices. So do you welcome this rise of new power? Do you hate it? Um, or do you simply just don't know yet? So who welcomes this new, new power? Ooh. OK, who hates it? OK, and who doesn't know? OK, well, we have a, an uncertain and positive audience. 
Quite right, too. <laughs> That's the right way to look at the world. <laughs> Uncertain and positive. It's <laughs> the best we can do in 2018. Yeah, yeah that's uh, interesting. Right, any questions? We have um, a few microphones roving around. Um, please wait until you get the microphone, until you ask your question, because we are filming this and we'd like to make sure that your brilliant question gets properly filmed. Um, it would be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself. And please keep your question or comment very short because I can see a lot of hands waving already. Let's start at the back near the microphone over there. Bob Glay, local Aspenite. Um, Strauss and Howe have put forth this more secular view of, called the fourth turning, where every hundred years there's you know, four generations and for seven, eight hundred thousand years, there's each generation has a identity that they're either makers or followers or destroyers. And that by the end of a hundred years, the people who are the youngest, let's use this conversation we're having right now, the, the, the people who are wanting change, destroy everything and remake it and start over. And that there's been cycles about every hundred years. Uh, versus the vertical and right. horizontal conversation you guys were just having. T tell us a little bit about what you think about cycles in history. Well, I think there's no doubt there are cycles. I think the question we ask in the book is, what is different about the speed, the scale, the density of um, today's uh, new, new, new movements and power, and how is that changing things? Because there are things that are qualitatively different about the last 20 years by the fact that we're now um, ubiquitously connected and can create movements like Me Too as quickly as we can, all these new business models, all these terrorist networks. And I, I don't think we know the answer yet to how that fundamentally changes or not some of the larger cyclical um, uh, dynamics you describe, whether it speeds those cycles up. Um, I don't know yet. Um, right, another question. We've got a question right at the front over here. I think you deserve the microphone for sitting underneath our noses. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy Fair. I'm a board member of the 92nd Street Y, and so I'm not very partial, but um, <laughs> I, have to, um, I, I have to ask you, I have seen um, these um, social platforms, these new power platforms, just a buzz, they're sounding boards, but often they don't have direction. They don't have execution plans. ISIS does, join us and we'll tell you what to do. But a lot of these um, social platforms are not sounding boards. So how do you, or maybe I'm wrong, but, but how do you get them to act, actually execute and, and deliver on what they're talking about? So I think that's a great question. Given it's one of my board members, I'm going to pivot to the 92nd Street Y. Um, so in an old power way. So the, if, if you think about all of this activity, the real question and what the book lays out is a set of skills which says, look, with all of this enthusiasm to engage, the book shows you how you can start to kind of find these connected crowds and shape them in the direction that you want them to go. And so one project we did at the Y was a project called Giving Tuesday. So everyone knows about Black Friday. Everyone knows about... Cyber Monday, both days about shopping, people lining up in front of stores and fighting over TVs. We created Giving Tuesday, which was a day to reverse the trend and get people to co contribute to good causes, donate clothes, donate food, donate um, time, their time. Um, six years ago, we launched that. It will go through a billion dollars raised this year in, in, in small donations of 100 bucks, 25% um, via cell phones across the US. And it's now in 100 countries. And, and it's in 100 countries, and that the 100 country leaders all run off one WhatsApp group on a phone. And this community around the world, last year we had a 2,000 events in Russia. Now, wh why is that an interesting story? It's an interesting story because there was a set of things that we did along the way there to think about, we the 92nd Street Y, as a Jewish organization serving people of all backgrounds, one of the core beliefs of us is community and philanthropy, which we traditionally did by having lectures about community and philanthropy at the 92nd Street Y. If you can get these people, the people you talk about, Christy, if you can start to push that current, not a currency, a current, in the direction of your outcomes, then you can start to get some outsized results. So the question we're asking at the why, the question organizations like the Aspen Institute is asking itself is, in this world of participation, how do we vastly expand our own participatory skills? And, and that's the reason we wrote the book, was to put those skills into the hands of, of people in this room. Fascinating. Hi. Right. I have a question back here. 
Um, so my name is Iman Ali. I work at the, in a research institute at the University of Chicago, and I work in social media research. I actually heard one of you guys at Social Media Weekend, and so I brought my book to get it signed. Um, <laughs> well, that's great. My question uh, is around, uh, well, I want to say first, the internet has allowed for this power to emerge, and I think you guys have made that point already. But there, there's, you have the Me Too movement in one hand, and then you have the Tiki Torch movement on the other hand. And, and sometimes, and everything in between, right? And so I've been part of the Me Too movement in pushing that forward, but I've also been at the receiving end of, of campaigns like the Tiki Torch. Um, how, do we, how do we balance the power so that the power is not misused um, or abused? or used to abuse. I think you need to briefly say what the Tiki Torch movement is, because oh, I think well, not everyone not in the room knows it. it. Wasn't, so when, when the alt-right, yeah, there was the alt-right thing that happened, racist. and they, they sort of hit the ground with Tiki Torches. Yeah. Um, and I think many of people who are in the public eye have been at some point doxxed by the alt-right or right. face that. Yeah, I mean, two quick thoughts. I mean, one is the, the role of these all-powerful new power platforms in our lives is critical to that. So we think about Facebook and Twitter and the way they have actually their business models, you know, are powered by those extremists in many ways on, on all sides. Um, and so we have to fundamentally, un, we have to unwind some of that. We need to get the benefits of these platforms, which enable us all to be connected to each other. Um, but we also need a public interest test applied to them. We, we have a term we use in the book, which we, which we describe as the public interest algorithm that you might reimagine instead of the secretive algorithm that, that is now in place with Facebook, where we don't know how our thoughts, our feelings, our political views are being shaped, because we can't actually see what it is that's filtered in and out. And so that requires um, political work. It requires us to be as political about Facebook and about the role of these platforms in our lives and their implications in democracy as we are about gun control or about climate change, you know, is the first point. The second point, I think, is very much the mission of the book for us was to get these tools in the hands of the angels. So we tried to write the book in a very practical way, and so we're not spending a lot of time at, um, you know, at uh, alt-right conventions talking about this book. Um, but the point is we wanted to share these ideas. So for the record, we haven't been invited. Any, any, any. Yeah. Yeah, right. that I, don't, was, I don't want that people was thinking dry, that, was, that yeah, wasn't a request. That was dry Australian humour. Yeah. Um, but, but we really want to get this in the hands of the climate scientist, the doctor who's taking on the anti-vaxxer, the people who are fighting for justice and tolerance and pluralism, and who start at a disadvantage from those people who are extremists, who can make anything they want up, and who can provoke. Um, that's the work here, and we'd, we'd love all of your help with doing that. And that can be small steps. I heard yesterday on Twitter from a radiologist um, who is she's really interested in, in, in artificial intelligence and radiology and how those two things to fit together and what they can learn to it. And she's built this amazing connected community of people all around the world who are trainee radiologists. So they can be at the forefront of understanding how AI and radiology fit together, completely outside the institution, completely kind of sideways peer to peer network. Those are the kind of steps we talked about some very big things today, but there are some small things people can start doing that really start to shift outcomes in their worlds. Yeah, no, that's very true. Now we've got a question there and there. And we, I've got one right at the back as well. Um, and one over there. there. Okay, you have to ask your question very fast. Hi, I'm Steve from, I live in Costa Rica. Um, the notion of uh, trust network, uh, years gone by, reminds me of Google and the zero moment of truth. And looking forward, <clears throat> it makes me think of blockchain, <clears throat> excuse me, blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies. And so I was wondering if you could comment as to whether blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, or trust networks. Well, so, so yes, in in, um, in practice, yes. So we see blockchain things like the blockchain, which if 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 you if you aren't familiar with the blockchain, it's like essentially it's a distributed ledger system. So it, it allows us to disintermediate things like banks and trust networks we've traditionally trusted on. Um, in principle, it's terrific. In the same way, in principle, the Titanic Titanic was unsinkable, <laughs> right? So we hear all this very enthusiastic things about things like the blockchain. But the pattern recognition here we should be clear about, which is we thought this too about the web. The web's going to be amazing. It will, there'll be democracy everywhere and everyone will be disintermediated and everything will be perfect. And of course, it doesn't work out like that. What happens is these technologies come along which on the surface seem to be democratizing and then people come along and build platforms on top of them. And those platforms actually then suck up all of the power. So I think there's reasons to be very optimistic about things like the blockchain, um, but I would be very careful about the hype. Right. Um, we have a question, two questions, oh, one right at the back, and then if we can, two up here. 
Hi, my name is Christine Nieves. I'm here from Puerto Rico. I'm one of the scholars this year. And can you see me? Oh, I know. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, so I've experienced what happens after a disaster in terms of new power, right? I, I, I spent my time up in the hill, up in the mountains where aid didn't get to us. And it was the power of community coming together without technology and coming together in transgenerational ways. So what that means is the grandmothers were with, in the same space with the millennials, with the kids, and the amount of wisdom that was harnessed from that and also the kids teaching the grandpas how to use their cell phones and the grandmothers teaching the kids how to cook. There, I, I am, I'm still experiencing the new power of building community and I'm still trying to figure out what are the platforms that can enable us to continue to build this community, to preserve the space we're in, to create economic opportunity for this place, the space we're in. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for, to, to hear your, your, your thoughts if you've seen technologies and platforms actually uh, wanting to partner uh, with the people on the margins because there's a lot of amazing stuff happening in the margins where no one's looking. Well, I think that's, that's so inspiring. And I think the real test for new power is how does it help the least powerful? And I, and I think that this is what's wonderful, that the positive note here is that many of these platforms, well-designed, really supercharge our very best instincts as people. So if you have a natural disaster and you know, someone can take a stranger into their home and networks make it so much easier to sort those people out for them to find each other at scale, it's at moments like that that all of the best things about human beings get, get, uh, get supercharged. And, and the answer is also how you design the platforms. And so a lot of what we talk about in the book is the design of these platforms. How do they uh, create effective trust? How do they establish reputation? How do they incentivize collaboration and not competition or polarization? And anyone who's thinking about new power can make very intentional choices about how, how they design these things so that we get to the kind of world you describe uh, more easily than the one that we're seeing. So this, uh, uh, I'm Rick Braddock. I'm a friend of one of the two people up there, but I won't say who. No, I'm very proud of this. <laughs> <laughs> but not a board member of the 92nd Street Y. No, no, you never offered me that. <laughs> and probably the fees aren't big enough anyway. <laughs> no, I, I'm, um, this book starts with a big idea, which is power. But power is neither a good nor a bad. It can be both a great and an evil. And I, I hear you sort of struggling around what I want to ask you, which is, how do you optimize around this idea? How do you inject a way to not only have the free form of this power unfold as a current, and, uh, but how do you, um, in effect, make it a predictable uh, path for the good, for the angels, as you call it? So I think there's two parts to that answer. Um, one is there's a set of, there are a set of skills that people need to start learning and quick. So, Jeremy told the story earlier of uh, a young ISIS recruit, a Scottish schoolgirl who builds an amazing, uh, successful girl-to-girl -girl network around the world using Twitter and Telegram and all of these platforms in very sophisticated ways. At the same time she's doing that, the US government is flying bombers over Syria and Iraq and dropping paper cartoons out of the back of those bombers, which show how bad life will be if you become a jihadi. Right? Uh, that tactic was first used in the First World War and it's still being used. So there's a set of old power behaviors and skills that people who need to be winning in the world just simply keep defaulting back to. So step number one is actually skills-based. We need to train up very, very quickly all of the people who are trying to push the world in the right direction to get good at these new power skills, number one. Number two, I think there's a big question around the platforms themselves. So if this is going to be an era of participation, if all the participation which happens is actually captured on a very small number of very powerful platforms, that is a danger um, for all of us. It's a danger for democracy. So I think it's a really interesting set of questions around how platforms might, might themselves behave differently. It's telling that Tim Berners-Lee, the, you know, the, the father of the web, the project he's working on right now is a project called Solid. And Solid is an idea where you have your data and you are interoperable. Platforms are interoperable. So you can leave one platform and head to another and take all of your data with you. And in his terms, your data reports to you. 
So rather than us handing our data over to these platforms and essentially being trapped on their land, instead we could wander freely across different platforms. So I think the second part of the answer is we need to see some platform reform and some platform pluralism, which means that the, the, the participation is not simply happening on two very well-fenced and very large pieces of land. Right, we've got a question over there, been waiting patiently, and then one more over there, so we'll have to be very quick. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Sakharides. I was uh, just wondering if you two gentlemen would apply the new power lens to uh, elective politics and think about what are the characteristics and qualities um, that uh, candidates will have. I think I'm thinking about the midterms. I'm thinking about the 2020 presidential election. Uh, not particular candidates necessarily, but what are the qualities and characteristics that will make candidates successful against incumbents, perhaps? So two, two thoughts. I think one critical piece. Um, don't treat your supporters like an army where you're just dishing out instructions. Find ways to really harness their creativity, their, their, their own desire to carry your message. That's what Donald Trump did, unfortunately, very well, right? He empowered those legions of supporters um, to develop their own memes, to attack Hillary Clinton. He found all of these ways to let them create a marketplace of ideas. Um, and that was highly effective. So don't you know, in, unleash their agency. Secondly, I think any successful candidate today needs to have intensity. So the, the sort of 20th century posture for a politician, which is I'm going to be non-controversial, I'm going to appeal to as many people as I can, I'm going to kind of gravitate uh, you know, to, to the middle. Unfortunately, that's not a posture that's a winning posture for many reasons related to these new dynamics. So um, whatever your message is, you need to cultivate intensity. Um, think about the NRA and how they've cultivated intensity around those causes. Think about the incredible young woman who just won uh, in New York. She had intensity, and that intensity ultimately trumped the broad favorability of her opponent. You know, it's funny because I went to both the Republican and the Democrat conventions in the summer of 2016, and you've summed up brilliantly what I instinctively felt, which is that um, you went to the Trump convention and you knew exactly what the message was make America great again. It's like the Brexit message, take back control. It had a verb, empowerment, mm -hmm. like en marche movement. Mm -hmm. It was clear, memorable. You went to the Democrats' convention, and first of all, you had two messages, not one. Um, stronger together, which is nice, but not much empowerment. And then I'm with her. And it probably ought to be, she's with me, yeah. not the other <laughs> way around. Yeah. So you had a muddle message, and it wasn't empowering. Right. And yeah, in right. some ways, that captures the dynamics that were so different in the election campaigns. But we are now very, very sadly out of time. I apologize, because I know a number of you were waving at me and, and have actually got the microphone, so I'm so sorry about that. But you will be around signing books, I believe, and yeah. selling books, so yeah. you can grab them now and ask your questions. Thank you very much indeed, and best of luck and figure out the new power.